Religion is especially connected to education because the purpose of education in many of the colonies was so that individuals could read the Bible. After all, they believed that no true relationship with God was possible unless you could read his word. In New England, many towns passed laws requiring the hiring of a schoolmaster to teach basic reading and writing, often just the boys, but sometimes the girls too. Higher education levels were available only to boys, included grammar schools to prepare them for colleges, as well as colleges themselves, with the first college established in the colony being Harvard in 1636 in Massachusetts. The purpose of colonial colleges was primarily to train ministers. The College of William and Mary in Virginia followed in the 1690s, and then Yale in 1702 in Connecticut. Most education, even in the New England colonies, was privately financed, at the very least books and supplies, which made education out of reach for many of those who were poor. And in the southern colonies, and of course rural areas, the lack of towns meant that really there was no community who felt the need to educate the youngsters of the poor. Their education in the wealthy areas, in the rural areas, the wealthy rural areas, was almost exclusively by private tutor, and therefore only the upper classes received any kind of education at all. Influencing both education and religion was the beginning of the age of the Enlightenment. It was an advancement of ideas that began in Europe around 1715 and lasted almost through the end of the century, about 1789 or so. It is closely associated with the scientific revolution, and the Enlightenment itself included elements of rational inquiry, scientific research, individual freedom, and religious and political tolerance. It also restored literature, the arts, and music as worthy of study in colleges and universities, leading to the establishment of a number of schools in the U.S. and reforming of many others away from a strictly Puritan curriculum, some even being established with no religious affiliation whatsoever. Many people of the Enlightenment believed in what was known as deism, which claimed that although God had created the world and designed the natural laws, it was those laws and not God himself that governed the operation of the universe. Essentially, they believed that God created the world, but no longer directly intervened in it. Education and progress would be necessary to improve the quality of people's lives, not prayers to a deity that didn't intervene. Important to this enlightenment in the U.S. was the notion of political freedom. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, both noted deists, followed the ideas put forth by English political philosopher John Locke, who believed that natural law called for a government that existed only with the consent of those it governed, and that the government itself had to respect the natural rights of all that it oversaw. With the Enlightenment encouraging a new look at religion and increased education, it's important to note that the men who are going to conduct the American Revolution would have all been coming of age and receiving their educations at the height of both the Great Awakening and the Age of Enlightenment, which would heavily influence their opinions of what constituted a good government and what was a bad government. As the colonies grew in North America, Remember that Britain wasn't the only nation seeking to profit from New World riches. Spain had, of course, been present even before Britain and had begun expanding into the southwest and up the coast of California. But as Spanish colonies were, for the most part, so distant from the British colonies, it would actually be the conflict with the French that would touch off a battle for control of North America. The French had long neglected truly building an empire in the New World, settling mostly for trading for fur, little outposts scattered throughout the Mississippi River Valley in eastern Canada. But once France gained control of the mouth of the Mississippi River and established the town of New Orleans, they could expand into farming, especially farming for grains, in the upper Midwest, which would put the French into a position to block English expansion deeper into the continent. Disputes in Europe over the control of the North American continent, continental Europe, and of trade with the New World would lead to the outbreak of a series of wars in the late 17th and throughout the 18th century. The first war began in Europe in 1688 and was fought on the European continent and the surrounding seas, as well as India and North America. By 1689, it had spread to the North American colonies, 
where this Nine Years' War, or the War of the League of Augsburg, as it is known in Europe, is known as King William's War. The war was largely caused by the English being particularly alarmed that the French were probably giving aid to Native Americans. Aid meaning weapons. There would be numerous raids by Native tribes on frontier colonial settlements, as many Native tribes were allied with the French. And the Spanish, who eventually would also ally with France, would attack outlying settlements in the Carolinas. There was an attempt by colonial forces to capture Quebec, but it failed, and for the remainder of the war, English colonists were primarily engaged in defensive operations, skirmishes, and retaliatory raids against the French. When the war ended in September of 1697, the colonial borders simply reverted to what they had been prior to the war. Five years later, in 1702, war broke out again. Once again, the war began in Europe and spread to the North American continent. This is the Spanish War of the Spanish Succession in Europe, but in North America it is known as Queen Anne's War. Once again, the war involved numerous Native American tribes allied with both sides. Spain, which was allied with France, launched attacks on the Carolinas to their north. Native Americans attacked English frontier settlements, and English settlers launched an attack on the French stronghold of Quebec, which failed. Although at the end of the war, they did win control of some land in eastern Canada, namely Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. In addition, Britain would gain some trading rights with Spanish America. After an uneasy peace, which was briefly broken by a skirmish in 1739 between British and the Spanish in the Caribbean, known as the War of Jenkins' Ears, the nations that dominated North America would once again be at war. Again, the war began in Europe in 1740, and by 1744 had spread to the colonies. This War of the Austrian Succession in Europe was known here as King George's War, named for King George II of England. Once again, France was allied with Spain, who attempted to attack English settlements to their north, but this time Georgia, with a colonial army, a militia led by James Oglethorpe, managed to repulse Spanish attacks. Native Americans launched attacks along the western frontier, and again a force of New England militia invaded New France with the goal of capturing Quebec. Rather than focusing on the city itself, though, this force of New Englanders captured Louisbourg, a major French fortress on Cape Breton Island, which controlled access to the St. Lawrence River, on which both Quebec and Montreal sat. But in the peace treaty that ended the war in 1748, Britain agreed to give Louisbourg back to the French in exchange for political and economic gains in India. New Englanders in particular were furious about the loss of the fort that they had fought bled, and died to win for England. As you can see, these first three wars for empire between England and France and Spain focused primarily on battles in Europe and only secondarily on conflict in the colonies. All three began as fighting in Europe and then later spread to the colonies. Really, you saw very little in the way of regular military forces being sent to the colonies to participate in the battles there. It was mostly militia and Native American allies. Militia being citizens who acted as soldiers. They had a regular day job. They weren't professionals. By now, though, both England and France recognized how important their colonies were and had begun shipping large numbers of troops overseas to North America rather than planning on to rely on amateur colonial forces in the event of another war, which really many saw as inevitable. This fourth and most decisive war that will break out beginning in 1754 would be known in the colonies as the French and Indian War. And the fighting actually began in the colonies two years prior to spreading to Europe. So there it is known as the Seven Years' War to reflect its shorter duration. The British felt the French provoked the war by building a chain of forts in the Ohio River Valley, preventing Britain from expanding westward. In 
in an attempt to stop the French from completing work on Fort Duquesne, which is located at the start of the Ohio River in what is today downtown Pittsburgh, where the Blue Arrow is pointing. The governor of Virginia sent out a military detachment, including a small militia under the command of a young colonel named George Washington. Washington's troops gained a small initial victory at the Battle of Jumonville Glen, but the English, knowing they were outnumbered, had attempted to build a small fortress, calling it Fort Necessity. But after Washington's skirmish, the British were unable to hold Fort Necessity and were ultimately forced to surrender to a superior group of French soldiers and their Native American allies on July 3, 1754. Washington and his men, though, were allowed to return to Virginia, and the whole incident would be seen as the trigger for the outbreak of this new round of war. In the surrender document, for example, Washington had admitted to the assassination of the French soldiers and the commander, who had been killed in their skirmish. Of course, the document was in French, a language that Washington did not speak. To truly oust the French, other expeditions by the British Army, including one led by General Edward Braddock, marched into the wilderness, and their expedition ended in disastrous defeat. From then on, the Algonquin allies of the French ravaged the frontier from western Pennsylvania all the way down to North Carolina. And there were attempts by the British military to invade Canada in both 1756 and again in 1757, which were both repulsed. In the midst of this, the British government recognized the need for coordinating colonial defenses and called for representatives from several colonies to meet at a Congress in Albany, New York, late in 1754. Delegates from seven of the colonies did and adopted what was called the Albany Plan of Union, developed by Benjamin Franklin, that would provide for an intercolonial government and a system for recruiting troops and collecting taxes in order to provide for that common defense. However, each colony was too jealous of its own taxation powers to accept the plan, and it never took effect. The significance, though, was that this was going to set a precedent for the later, much more revolutionary Congresses that would meet in the 1770s. You also saw some significant changes with the government. William Pitt, the elder, would gain control of the government's efforts in the war and refocused the military strategy on conquering Canada rather than chasing Native Americans up and down the frontier. His plan began with the retaking of Fort Louisburg in 1758, which led to the surrender of Quebec a year later and the capture of Montreal a year after that in 1760. Another significant change was that George III took over in 1760 as the new king after the death of his grandfather, his father having died a few years prior. And the young, headstrong king was determined not just to reign as king of England, but to rule his empire and win the ongoing war. Most of the fighting had now ended in North America, though it did continue in Europe. And by 1763, the French had had enough, they had lost, and they negotiated a treaty to bring the war to a conclusion. This Treaty of Paris of 1763 resulted in France losing control of nearly all of its New World territories, except for a couple of islands in the Caribbean and two tiny ones off the coast of Newfoundland. Spain would cede control of Florida to Britain, but would receive Louisiana and the whole Louisiana Territory from France as compensation. The war would change the economic political, governmental, and social relationship among those three European powers, their colonies, and even the people who inhabited those colonies. France and Britain would both suffer financially because of the war, and it would be this financial consideration that would cause the change in the relationship between Britain and her colonies. 